Welcome back, ladies and gents, to this episode of the Formula Podcast with me, your host, Trevor Carlson. On this show, we share my experiences, experiments, and conversations around designing a fulfilling life in whatever form that means for you. And today, we're going to talk about one of my favorite things, coffee, with a side of startups. Our guest today is Joshua Zluf. He is the founder of Sudden Coffee. It's described as instant coffee made like no other coffee in the world. I haven't had a chance to try it yet, but as soon as I come back to the United States, I promise Joshua I'll be having and ordering some of your coffee and maybe I'll be bringing some with me the next time I travel abroad. So really pumped to have this conversation or share this conversation with you. He really shares a lot as well because, you know, as a coffee brand, especially in the quick instant coffee world, there's a lot of competitors. So we talk a lot about how he got started and then how he transitioned into, or how him and his team really transitioned Sudden Coffee into what it is now. So I wanna get this conversation started with Joshua, but first, let's hear a quick word about our sponsors. All right, all right, all right. Let's give a quick shout out to our first sponsor of this week's episode, Lady Boss. Lady Boss is a women's health company that provides workout plans, supplements, all kinds of stuff to help women really live more healthy, at least physically better lives. And it was founded by Kaylin Poulin. Hopefully she'll be a guest of the show here sometime soon. Head on over to the formulapodcast.com and click on the sponsored products page if Lady Boss products sound like something that would be interesting for you. Our next sponsor is Liquid Web. Now, if you're looking to launch some type of e-commerce store, drop shipping, whatever it is, you know, maybe you've listened to the episodes with Adrian, Ketsu, or all three of us, we're talking about our different e-commerce ventures that we've gotten into. But Liquid Web has these pre-made solutions just for you guys. So they were also nice enough to hook up Formula Podcast listeners with 33% off all their products. So if you type in Formula 33 on the checkout page, you're going to get 33% off whatever you decide to pick up over at Liquid Web. Dot com. Now, let's get on to the show. Josh, thanks so much for taking the time to sit down and chat with me today. I'm really pumped to hear kind of your origin story and how you got started with uh, Sudden Coffee. It's already almost 8 p.m. where I'm at, so I don't think I'll be enjoying any tonight, but hopefully in the near future, I can enjoy one of your cups of coffee. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Hopefully, we'll be in Europe soon, so we'll be able to get it out there. <laughs> Yeah, because I'm sure you didn't wake up and just start sudden coffee one day. I'm sure there was a lot of things that happened in your life that got you to the point. I mean, I have so many questions like why coffee and how did you come up with the amazing branding? We were kind of talking about that before. Just tell me how you got here. Yeah, it's definitely one of those stories where a bunch of experiences over the course of probably a decade kind of culminated in me finding my way to this. Yeah, so as an industrial engineer, I was just really in the idea of making factories or restaurants or things like that more efficient. So I studied that in school. I had this experience at a McDonald's where I was waiting in line too long. My mind just lit on fire with all the ways that you could improve the process and the flow and all of that stuff. And so I left college. I went to consulting. I realized that that's where you can get paid to do that and did that for a few years, went to factories, call centers, all that stuff. And after doing that for a few years, I'd grown up in the Bay Area. I asked myself, like, how do you fix those same problems with tech? And I wanted to get into tech. I moved back home, tried doing a startup for six months at the time. This is way back when failed. And I realized, hey, I need to learn how to do this. So I joined Groupon. Groupon was taking off at the time and working on restaurant apps. And I found a few mentors there that really taught me about startups, about tech. And I was lucky enough to spend a bunch of time in a lot of fine dining restaurants, a lot of Michelin star restaurants where we were making products, we were making a point of sale for them to use. And through that experience, I saw that restaurants and hospitality and food, it's not about being efficient. It's about how you make people feel. It's about making someone uh, a little bit happier in the middle of their really busy day. And so I got really excited about that idea and I knew I wanted to do a startup again. I left Groupon and I just started working on all of these hospitality driven ideas, like ways you could share craft experiences with more people. I wanted to figure out how to make it, you know, not $300 for someone to get Michelin star style service. Right. So that really just drove me like, how can I make people feel better and do that? using my skill set of making things kind of efficient. And so I spent a year and a half trying idea after idea after idea. And eventually, one of my mentors introduced me to my co-founder. 
And I met Kale. He had been in coffee for 10 years and had a similar realization where he realized that a great cup of coffee isn't about being scientifically perfect, but it's about making someone feel good. We vibed on that, and he had had a prototype of what sudden would become, but the problem was it was really freaking expensive, and you could only make 10 of them every week. You know, he said, yeah, I got this thing. I don't know how to make it efficient. I don't know how to scale it. And I said, great, that's what I can help with. So we teamed up, and the rest is history. How long have you been working on Sudden Coffee for? So Sudden Coffee specifically has been three and a half years now. Damn, that's a long time, especially in a like, new business startup world. Yeah, it's been a hell of a journey. And two years from now, you're always in startup mode worrying if you're going to fail or can I get to the next milestone? And so, yeah, just looking back and reflecting, it's been great. So when you look back on the time when you guys were getting the company off the ground, I'm sure you had kind of a vision of where you thought it was going to go. Has that really played out the way you anticipated it would? I think parts of it definitely have and parts of it have gone into a totally different direction. The underlying mission for us has stayed the same. And that's taking something that is a really delicious and amazing craft product and just making it more accessible, making it so that you don't need to have a bunch of brewing equipment, making it so that you don't need to live next to the best cafe in the world to have some of the best coffee in the world. And so we're more and more just getting better and better at executing on that vision. I think the part that we shifted on is we really wanted to make this tech enabled experience, like have a mobile app, have a way where you could tag every cup of coffee you drank and share that with people. I used to use an analogy of having a virtual cafe. And we realized that we were just focusing on too much and no one had made really good instant coffee. And there was so much to just get that right that we couldn't focus on both that and having a slick mobile app and having all of this Instagrammable content and things like that. And so that was the part that we kind of had to pivot away from or shift gears on was really interesting to go through. Yeah. So when you say you had to shift gears, can you give me a bit of an example? Yeah. So when we started, we thought that we made this prototype in a garage and we thought that what we were going to do was take really good coffee beans, find a co-packer, find someone who already makes instant coffee and just say, hey, take these really good coffee beans, send us back powder and package it. And we're going to do the branding and marketing and all of that stuff. In that world, you know, we would focus on making it really fun to buy it and really fun to share it and all that stuff. And the more time we spent in the industry, we found out that there just wasn't a co-packer who could do it. No one Mm -hmm. had really put together the pieces in this way. And so we kept trying to focus our energy on running good Facebook ads or redoing the website. But then we would get pulled into these production problems and pulled into like, you know, how do we increase capacity further? Like what's going on with flavor? And we kept fighting that. Like we kept wanting to hire an engineer to build the app and focus on stuff like that. And I would say it wasn't at the time a really conscious pivot, but then at a certain point you realize, hey, I'm spending most of my time on this problem. That's not what I originally set out to do. And then when you wear that hat, okay, how does that change our business model? And it took about a year and a half to get there. We said, okay, so like, we're not going to sell this off of a mobile app. We're just going to focus on making really good instant coffee. And we're going to focus on new sales channels, getting it out in as many places as possible, using traditional retail, using partnerships, using ways that other people sell food instead of this tech enabled experience that was a little bit further out there, if that makes sense. And so off of that, we stopped using a subscription model. We started trying to offer it into as many places as possible. And eventually, we found the business model that we're focusing on now, which is partnering with roasters. And since we started doing that, Sudden has been really, really taking off. Yeah, so it's almost like you started out with this tech-heavy solution, and then it kind of almost went back to having, it was more focused on the actual product itself. Yeah, exactly. The way that I frame it up for folks now is I used to think we were building a brand company, like a tech-enabled brand company, and instead we are building a product that is a manufacturing-based product that didn't exist before. Mm -hmm. And those are very different challenges. Probably takes a different skill set to pull off each one. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'm curious about this because there's a lot of companies out there that make their own coffee. There's, I mean, Keurig kind of has their own thing going on. A lot of companies are starting to produce like their own instant coffees. What is it about your coffee that really sets you guys apart from somebody else that somebody might be using in their kitchen right now? 
Yeah. So first, let me give you a quick primer on what instant coffee is, because a lot of people don't actually know. So instant coffee is coffee that has been fully brewed and then dehydrated. It's basically preserved. And so it's different than a K-cup. You have a K-cup or an espresso pod. It's actually coffee grounds that are being extracted or brewed real time. And a lot of times folks will say a K-cup tastes watery because it's hard to brew coffee that quickly without having a really fancy espresso machine. And so Instant coffee is really great for that to solve that problem because you can brew it to perfection up front, dehydrate it, and then it's ready to go. All you need to do is mix water. So I had a misunderstanding then of what that was. So thank you for correcting me. Yeah, totally. And so within the instant coffee space, so when you go to Folgers or Nescafe and traditional instant coffee, the way their process works, so first off, they use the lowest quality beans available. It's usually the leftover stock from farms. And then they roast it super dark to hide any of the defects. So it ends up tasting kind of burnt to begin with. Then it gets brewed up to five times because they want to extract as much out of the bean as possible to make it really cheap. A coffee bean's mostly made out of wood. So if you take too much out of the bean, it it literally tastes woody. And then they'll use these heat-based processes to dehydrate it. So similar to like, imagine boiling off water from soup. And all of those things are designed to make it really cheap and affordable. I think that's great. You know, that makes coffee really easy for a lot of people to access. And what we did is we took the opposite approach at every step. So we use some of the highest quality beans available. We use a brewing process that's really, really gentle, similar to making a pour over. And then we use processes to dehydrate it. So we concentrate it first and then we freeze dry it and we don't use heat at any of those steps. And that was really hard to do. And we had to find some really next level technology to be able to to make it work. That's kind of how we've done it. So now, you know, a lot of folks have entered the instant coffee space. A lot of the bigger roasters you see actually might be using us as the supplier. So we make coffee under other companies' brands. And then the thing that Sutton's been able to figure out is we figured out how to make it cheaper and much higher capacity than anyone else who's making really great instant coffee. Okay. That makes a lot more sense then. So you've got more than one business model working here then, right? Yeah, totally. So if you head to our website, you'll see an e-commerce platform. You can buy it online. You can also buy it on Amazon. Mm -hmm. But what's really been working for us is we work with folks like Intelligentsia, Equator Coffee, Ritual Coffee. So some of the premium roasters in the U.S., And they send us coffee beans, we turn it into instant coffee, package it with their branding and send it back to them. That's pretty brilliant. A friend of mine that does something similar with, it's not instant lip balm, but he does it with uh, lip balm. So what he does, him and his wife came up with this really, this environmental friendly way to produce lip balm. And then they used only like natural ingredients and they figured out how to do that. But then when they built out their manufacturing facility, they had all this extra room to manufacture a packaged lip balm in the same packaging that they use that's using like environmental friendly packaging. So they've then built their their production line out. Sorry, not their production line. Their <laughs> this other business model out where they're actually even packaging people that are essentially their competitors as well. Yep, totally. That totally makes sense, especially for lip balm actually because the packaging there is usually not eco-friendly. All right. He's probably ending up in the ocean somewhere or something afterwards, but that's a whole nother topic. Yeah, whole thing. So I drink quite a bit of coffee, probably an unhealthy amount as I travel around. For some reason, I think it's just a habit to start my day with like a hot cup of coffee. You know, there's definitely been some places where I've had some amazing coffee and others where I'm like bitter and not very good. I'm curious from a professional and a personal standpoint to you, like what is like an an amazing, like good cup of coffee mean? Yeah. So I'll say that I'm someone at a personal level, coffee for me is like pizza. Mm Mm-hmm. I really appreciate a great cup of coffee, but bad coffee is still coffee and I'll still drink it. (laughs) Okay. But yeah, what I really like, so I really like white roasted coffees, specifically coffees from like Ethiopia. Coffees from Africa in general tend to be a little bit more fruity and I can kind of break that down if that's helpful, like what goes into that. Yeah, absolutely. That'd be helpful. So specialty coffee, and that's kind of the industry we're in, it's this movement to treat coffee a lot more like wine. And so when you get coffees from different regions of the world, they taste really different, just in the same way that a wine from Napa is going to taste different than a wine from Bordeaux. And so 
coffees from South America, this also really varies by country, but, you know, like a Colombian coffee, I think of as traditionally being a little bit more chocolatey or caramelly. And coffees from Ethiopia, at least the ones I've tasted, taste to me really fruity. And you know, coffee comes from a fruit. So you're getting some of those natural acids and it can taste kind of interesting. And usually when you get coffees that are lighter roasted, it allows a lot of the original characteristics to come out because you're not overcooking it. Whereas when you get a dark roasted coffee, like what you get with a French roast or an espresso, you're kind of charring a lot of the flavors, especially if it's not roasted really well. So when you get a light roasted coffee and you get one from a unique origin, you'll actually pick up a lot of these differences. And that makes it really cool, especially if you taste coffees side by side, you'll actually pick up like what's different about them. But yeah, a lot of that comes also down to the brewing. So like once you have this really great coffee and then it's roasted properly, you need to have a barista who knows how to brew it well. You want the perfect amount out of the bean. Similar to what we do with instant coffee, if you get too much out of the bean, it'll taste a little woody. If you get too little out of the bean, it could taste sour. And so like having that knowledge is really helpful. That's kind of like all the stuff that goes into it. And that's a mouthful, but... Right. Now I'm thinking about how inadequate that my knowledge of coffee actually is for as much as I consume. Yeah, I think this is all a new thing. You know, like there's a lot of folks who might have the coffee snob mentality. Coffees like this didn't really exist 10 years ago or mm -hmm. 15 years ago. Or if they did, it was only in really specific places because the origin of coffee, you know, it was really just this way to get caffeine and like people were drinking coffee back in the Civil War and it's really just like something to keep you warm and keep you going. And this idea of having these really high quality single origin coffees is such a new thing that I wouldn't expect most people to know about it. And that's like a big part of our mission is to educate more people about it because right now it's just like really hard to get to. Like you need to be in the right place. You need to go to the right cafe. You need to have a barista who brews it properly. And so we kind of just do that for you. So, I mean, you're more of a coffee kind of story than I am. I just drink whatever good stuff I can get my hands on wherever I'm at. But there's definitely a difference in the quality of coffee based on the brewing process, at least in my opinion. Personally, I feel like pour overs really good. Sometimes drip can be good as well if I haven't had it for a while. Making it, I'm going to butcher the terms, so you might have to correct me, like using the espresso maker to actually make like a Americano type of cup of coffee. Like all of them kind of produce a different result. So I'm curious, you know, which one actually actually makes like the most pure form of coffee and then like what is the difference in process that takes place produces a different flavor a different strength or whatever you want to call it yeah totally that's a great question so there's no method that's better than the other methods mm -hmm. they all come out a little bit differently but the knowledge or how you brew each method is a little different so if you're brewing an espresso perfectly versus brewing a French press perfectly, both will taste really good in different ways. But, you know, you can screw both of them up by doing it wrong. I think at a basic level, what's going on when you make coffee, there's like a little bit of the chemistry behind it. You're taking coffee beans and you're trying to get some of the coffee bean to dissolve into the water. You have these coffee grounds and it's kind of like a surface area problem. So if the coffee grounds have less surface area. You want to soak them in water for more time to be able to get more out of the bean. And so if you use like a French press where you're putting water in the coffee and it's sitting there for like two or three minutes or four minutes, you want to use bigger coffee grounds. Like you don't want your grinds to be as fine. When you're using espresso where the water is touching the coffee for like half a second or less, you want to use coffee grinds that are really fine because there's just not as much room for the water to interact with the coffee. So that's why espresso is ground really fine. Mm -hmm. What's different about taste of French press versus tasting an espresso is, so like the ideal amount, like you want about 20% of whatever's in the bean to end up in your cup. We call that a 20% extraction, but you're getting different parts of the bean depending on the brewing method. So, you know, you might get, and, you know, this goes down to different aromatics or flavor molecules. So just based off of like what the method is, you know, you might get some of the sweeter notes or you might get some of the more chocolatey note that 
depends on the bean and it depends on when it was roasted. So you do want to hit this 20%, whether it's espresso or a French press or a pour over. But what that 20% makes up is a little different every time. I think the question everyone asks is about caffeine first. And so like caffeine dissolves really easily. So that's one of the parts that like you're going to get no matter what you do. Even if you under brew the coffee, it's still going to be caffeinated. You're just not going to get as much flavor out of it, if that makes sense. So as we're talking about the different brewing methods and the caffeine levels of the different types of coffee, is there a personal preference that you have? For brewing methods? Well, just the result. I mean, is there a preferred method as a coffee consumer that you prefer over? So I really like pour overs personally. I first off, I like the amount of volume you get. So an espresso shot for me is not enough coffee. And I don't like how an Americano comes out. I like a pour over comes out. So you have coffee grounds and then you're filtering it through water. And so as a result of that, it comes out very clean. Like you're really just getting the flavors of the liquid itself and whatever is dissolved in it. Whereas when you do a French press, like the methods that use immersion brewing, where you're like immersing the beans in water, you'll end up with like a little bit more of the graininess in the grind sometimes. And that's totally just a personal preference. I don't think there's a right or wrong way, but I kind of just like how the pour overs will end up being more bright and, you know, good from that perspective. A pour over, by the way, I think there's a misconception that I've just learned through coffee. So a pour over and a drip coffee are actually pretty similar. Yeah. The problem with drip coffee usually is that it ends up being stale because usually someone will make a pot of coffee at the office, they'll leave it. And so it's just like sitting there for like an hour and you're having the coffee probably at longer than 20 minutes after it's been brewed. It's going to just taste a little bit off. But if you use really high quality coffee beans and you have a good dripper, it's going to be the same style of coffee and on par with a really good pour over. Okay. I can definitely relate to drinking a stale pot of coffee out of a, you know, just a normal coffee machine. But I didn't realize that it's like the same, I guess, you know, logically now thinking about it, I'm like, yeah, it kind of makes sense because, well, one, you're just doing it manually versus a machine doing it for the other. Yeah. One of the things my co-founder always tells people is, you know, machine is actually better at pouring water consistently than a person. And so if you have the right machine, you're going to end up with an even better prepared cup. But the reason people do pour overs is because you can do one cup at a time. And that's like why you've seen that explosion. But it's not actually necessarily a superior brewing method. And it's a lot easier to screw up a pour over. Yeah, I feel like I've definitely screwed up a pour over before. But like you said, maybe you just leave it to a machine or somebody at a coffee shop to make it. So we've talked about the different brewing methods, what makes a cup of coffee a bit different, you know, if you're using drip, French press, espresso machine. Let's talk a bit about like your processes, because, you know, you were talking about how you want to make this coffee available for 10 times less or a tenth of the price of what it was previously available available on the market for. I'm personally curious of how you were able to pull that off. Yeah, really good question. I think honestly, that's where we really shine. Like that's the thing that we've done really well. So when we started, it used to cost us $6 to make each cup of sudden. And now it's closer to 75 cents. And the way that we did that, we really started with the lean startup approach. We wanted to get something out as fast as possible to test if there was a market. So we did everything by hand. We got a freeze dryer on the internet. We made espresso shots. My co-founder was pulling coffee shots. I was packaging everything and sending it out and doing the dishes. And that was kind of how we started. And then, you know, when you figure out, like when you're trying to figure out how to reduce costs, the most important thing, and this is for any business, is spending a couple days analyzing your current cost structure to figure out what your biggest cost centers are. Because I see a lot of folks try to reduce cost by focusing on the thing that seems obvious to them, but it's actually not costing them the most money. So after that, I sat there with a stopwatch. I timed every piece of the process. I added up all of the materials that were going into it. And I looked at, you know, what are the biggest things like what's taking the most time and number one was packaging and it was not the packaging itself but it was like getting coffee into a test tube was really really painful and then number two was brewing and so that sort of set me up on the roadmap and so I was like okay if over the next quarter I can figure out how to reduce packaging costs by half that'll be great. And then if I can figure out how to reduce brewing costs by half, that'll be great. And so the first way to reduce packaging costs was getting a bigger funnel. 
Like that was it. I got a bigger funnel that knocked out a dollar's worth of costs. And it's like that type of stuff that I think a lot of people miss when they're approaching cost. You know, like they'll focus on outsourcing or like getting the crazy machine, but they'll miss this basic stuff. Like just get a funnel, get a bigger funnel, spend your time on that. And that took me like three days and we reduced cost. And so going through that step by step and focusing on the right things was I would say the biggest tip I would give anyone. The hard part, and this is where it gets like a little more interesting, was figuring out technologies we could use. And let me know if this is like two in the weeds of this is helpful. But yeah, I mean, I, I think we knew that we wanted to figure out a better way to brew. I use that. That was like the other thing. And brewing at scale using all of the stuff that I talked about earlier, like having the right extraction and treating the beans really gently, there was no one who could do that. And so I think the really hard thing about startups is you don't have any internal knowledge. You know, you're not a big company where you have people who've been doing it for 20 years. And so you have to get really good at getting information externally. And so that means taking the time to go to a conference where you might otherwise not prioritize it, even if you can't see the direct value, because like you don't know that you're going to go meet someone and they're going to help you like you just can't predict that stuff. So you have to invest time in these things that are just like putting out your message, putting your problem out there. Like one thing I've started to do is even if we're facing a hard production or brewing problem, I'll post that on Instagram. Like I will post my biggest problem on our Instagram story and say, hey, like, does anyone know how to handle this? Or, you know, we're trying to find someone who really knows about chemistry or trying to find someone who really knows about packaging. Like anyone out there who knows it? Or I try to do a press release that talks about something cool we're working on, but also covers a problem that we have. So if anyone's listening, they'll hit us up with help. And that, I think, was a way that we found some of our more unique pieces of technology. It was through that process, as opposed to us sitting in a lab and designing things ourselves. I think that's a good lesson just for startups in general. Wouldn't you agree? I mean, depending on no matter what industry you're in, really. Yeah, absolutely. I've called it like, how do you generate black swan events? Like, how do you create... (laughs) like these random occurrences where you'll match up with the specific person who happens to know the thing that you need. It's not through just hammering your head against a wall. It's through putting your message out there. It's through telling a story. It's through trying to just talk to as many people as you can, finding the right experts. And yeah, whether your problem is marketing, whether your problem is recruiting, whether your problem is sales or production or engineering, like when you have a five person team, that is a much better use of your time. And it's really hard to justify for someone like me where it's like, I want the to do list. I want to know that if I spend an hour here, it's going to generate a return because you can't put a return on a lot of those activities. It's something that maybe isn't measurable necessarily. I mean, it's probably something that can have a big impact if you invest that time or, you know, what do you call them? Black swan events? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. If you can create those. Exactly. So looking back, if you could talk to, you know, yourself when maybe at the beginning of sudden or at, you know, pivotal moments in time through the company's history, what advice do you think that you would give yourself? Yeah, I've thought about this a lot, but what I do differently. I think we spent a lot of time focused on making a subscription model work because it's trendy or because that's what everyone around us was doing and not focusing on, you know, just figuring out how to improve our product, like our manufacturing process, how we can make more of it or dropping it for other channels. And I think like the takeaway, and I don't know how to teach someone this, is you read all these marketing books for startups. They always start with saying like, try out every channel and have a bunch of small tests and, you know, focus on the ones that work. I've developed this intuition now where like, if it's a channel that's working, it really hits you over the head that it's working. Like since we switched into doing these partnerships with roasters, we've been unable to keep up. We're sold out every week. We're like at capacity. Our biggest problem is production. When we were doing Facebook ads, as another channel, it was always like kind of working. I never could throw it out. Like I never was like, this totally sucks. It was always like, oh, if I just do this, it'll be a little bit better. It'll be a little bit better. But when I looked at what our problems were, like we were way over capacity. We had way too much coffee. That means that no one was buying it. And so the channels that work are going to just like hit you over the head, like tell you that it's working. And I wish I could have given myself the advice when I was trying these channels. I ended up sticking with it maybe like two months too long. Like I should have spent a month on it and I spent three months on it. But when you add that up, that ends up being a couple years. And I just wish I had a way to communicate 
like what it feels like when you have a channel that's working. It's just like a feeling that you kind of pick up. Yeah. You know, I have a few e-commerce students and one of them is running a lot of these channel tests. And as he's doing it, he's like, how do I know if it's working? And I'm like, well, I think you'll know if it's not working. If it is working, I don't think you'll be asking me if it's working or not. You know, if, if you have to ask yourself if something is working or not, it's probably not working. I think that's a good way to frame it. I think the other thing that I realized is like for a channel to work, the economics on user acquisition for the first 100 customers coming out of that channel has to be really, really cheap. If that's the case, then you know the channel is working. And so for Facebook ads, we were closing people for like $50 a subscriber and our break even point was $40. I was like, we're $10 away, but it needed to really be like $3. Like if you're closing customers for $3 for your first 100, then you know that when you get to 10,000 customers, maybe you'll still be breaking even at that level. It's still hard for the first 100, then probably not the right channel. And so that's kind of like if the first 100 through a channel are not ridiculously easy, then it's probably the wrong. That's sort of been my learning. I'm going to remember that. It's actually very similar to another guest I had. He discussed what he called the 100 click test. If you don't feel like a product is on fire, like an ad says on fire, like producing after 100 clicks to your website, then you do not have a winning funnel or a winning product at that point in time. And you need to revamp something like something is broken. So I feel like you're kind of saying the same things. Yeah, totally. And honestly, like it's really hard for folks who are coming from big companies because like a 5% improvement on the landing page for a big company is really significant. We would hire marketing people and they'd say like, well, cool, if we get like a 10% improvement, that's great, right? And I would always try to communicate like, you know, if it's working, it's going to work. Like, well, no, we don't. There's no statistical significance we need. Like, we'll know that it's working intuitively. I think that's just hard if you're like so used to having large data sets, which. You have your funnel set up, maybe like when you're discussing running Facebook ads and, you know, you're maybe running $10 over your break even point. I mean, would you recommend just basically throwing in the towel on that channel completely or would you recommend taking a step back and maybe revamping your strategy for it a bit to try to get that cost of acquiring that customer down? Yeah. So to be honest, now I would throw it out immediately. And that for me is the learning because two years ago, I would have said the exact opposite thing. And this was, you know, like with Facebook ads specifically, like refine the copy, change the landing page, change the ad, change the photography, look for little gains. That was kind of a waste of time. Whereas to give you a contrast with our roaster partnerships model, before we even had the roaster partnerships model, roasters were coming to us. As soon as we launched with one roaster, three more roasters came to us. We did no marketing. We didn't have a sales team. The service we offered was subpar from like how we actually put packaged it. And people were still like, we want this. We want this. We want this. Like the customer was coming to us, hitting us over the head saying, I want this. <laughs> you know, to apply that to what I was doing on Facebook, it's like, you know, I could make the copy better and I made the photography better. But if it was really the right channel, I think people would have just bought it despite the copy being bad, despite the photography being bad. They would have been like, this fits something in my life. I need this. I want this. So if it's not working, I would either just drop the channel or I would focus on improving the product itself and not focus on refining the channel. That's what I would tell myself. I don't know. Obviously, like I'm sure there are folks out there who have the opposite experience, but that's the biggest piece of advice I would give to Josh two years ago. Yeah. And I'm thinking about this and Sean Linderbaum was a previous guest on the show and he was talking about his first e-commerce company and he was discussing how they had the shittiest <laughs> landing page on the planet, terrible photos, kind of bad copy, just very simple. And, you know, if you saw that type of page now, you'd probably never buy anything from them. But he said they were selling stuff so fast, they couldn't even keep it in stock. So that kind of speaks to like what you're saying, where you didn't have really a sales team weren't doing any marketing. So if it's just tweaking a picture just a little bit, if you think that'll make a difference and to go from zero sales to selling a ton, then you're probably, I mean, myself included, because I've definitely done this. I'm like, if I just tweak the copy a little bit or, you know, tweak the ad a tiny bit, maybe I'll get some more sales. So I think what you're saying is actually really good advice that I also need to heed. Yeah, I would say like, like the channel that's working should be pretty easy to get to like 50k in monthly revenue if it's a good channel. Like at some point you do need to refine the channel, 
but it needs to be giving you baseline that is just good with a really crappy landing page, photography, everything. Now you're making me think about a lot of the experiments I've been running <laughs> and how I can kill so many of them so much faster. Yeah. So kind of taking my own advice a little bit as well. That's excellent. I have a few questions more on the personal side of running a business. A lot of what this show is about is kind of understanding not only how people do things professionally, but personally as well. As you're building this business, you know, how do you find balance between you know, what you're doing at work, building sudden coffee and kind of having some level of personal life outside of it? Yeah, that's a great question. I think I usually have the opposite answer from a lot of folks. I uh, talk to you who are founders. The most pivotal thing I've ever done in my career was to hire a coach for myself, like a goals coach or a career coach. And her name's Michelle. I still work with her now. And the first thing she helped me do is identify what my core values were. And then after that, once I started working on stuff, she was sort of the voice of reason, almost like your manager who was just keeping me on track, but also keeping me balanced. Balanced. And one of the things that came out of doing my core values was I have five core values. You know, a couple of them are like growth and purpose and are these very like driven things. And then another one that's important for me is relaxation. And I like to just have these like Saturdays where I do nothing. Like I have no to-do list. Like my work week is just meeting, 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 or I'm like running a thousand percent. And then on the weekend, you know, I could sleep until like 11 a.m. or 1 p.m. even, you know, and I'm like 33 and people are like, dude, like, what's wrong with you? Like, you got to get out of bed. Like, why are you doing this? <laughs> or I'll have a day where I'm just like floating, you know, I'll go to the park and I'll just kind of do whatever I feel like doing and, you know, not have a to-do list or, you know, I'm not always on at work. And so that's been like really, really important for me to stay sane. And the other things are just being really intentional about self-care. So like, I don't work on the weekends. I try to leave work at six or seven. I think with a startup specifically, you're kind of in control of the nozzle of how fast you move. And so if you're not careful, you can just tell yourself like, cool, I got to work 14 hours a day. If I do that, I'll make more money. I'll like everything will be better. And you burn yourself out. And so I've kind of taken the attitude of saying, all right, Josh, you're only going to work eight hours or nine hours today, what are the highest priority things you can do in those eight or nine hours? And that's it. And that's all you're going to do. And if that means like you're going to be months late, like literally filing the taxes for sudden coffee, okay, pay the penalty, but don't sacrifice your well-being or your mental health or all of those things because you're just creating this debt that is going to come back in the form of burnout or needing to quit or, you know, disappearing or whatever. And I've had those moments too. And, you know, I'm still fighting against that all the time, but it's like, you know, trying to have more discipline or control around forcing myself to relax and hang out and see friends and, you know, do things that are enjoyable. Yeah. I really like your answer. We talked about this a bit earlier where back in when I was with a startup and I mean, balance isn't even a word that <laughs> I would call what I was doing. And I would imagine you probably feel the same way, but looking at how much I'm able to get done or it's not even productivity. I just feel like I have more energy when I'm at work, when I take more time outside of work to invest my personal health and my habits, my relationships, and really just take some time for myself. Maybe it's sleeping all day or something, whatever it is. I feel like when you do that, you actually really energize yourself more at work and you're able to do a better job, I guess, at work than if you're just like, all right, my life is building this thing. I'm going to eat, sleep and breathe this thing until it's hit this point. Yeah, I think that's 100% true. I like to, you know, scream and shout that message because, you know, like we were in Y Combinator and when you're in Y Combinator for the three months, it's an incubator for those who haven't heard about it. You're like, the tone there is okay, like live, breathe and die your startup. And that's because you're just doing it for three months. And I think that makes sense to do for three months. But then a lot of people carry that attitude for their whole life or for everyone at their company's life and, you know, all of that stuff. And then it becomes unsustainable. It's not healthy to do that for more than three months. And having that like holistic view is so important. The other thing I think this is like has been true for me is the thing people say a lot is like, you know, in the time that you're not working on your startup, like go to the gym and meditate and do all of those types of things. But like for me, like 
you know, I'll be honest, like on a Friday, I like to go see like a techno DJ. And sometimes I'll stay out till 3 a.m. You know, my sister's a DJ. For me, like I kind of grew up with that influence, you know, to a lot of people that's like unhealthy. Like, why would you drink, you know, do the healthy thing, sleep early. But I'm an extrovert. So like being around people rejuvenates me. It brings me back to life. It helps me, you know, stop thinking about our burn rate and all those things. And so it's not only like do things outside of work. It's like, hey, even if you're doing something that other people will perceive as being unhealthy or not for them. And I do meditate also like I love meditating. I don't really work out. But you know, I'm not doing the like go to the gym, which is what a lot of people say you should do. Maybe I should. But (laughs) there are other things that are totally also healthy or will help you balance that I don't think people talk enough about. Yeah, I've read more habit books and health books and and stuff like that than I can even count at this point because of, you know, that time of being unbalanced. I was like, how can I fix this or reverse this? So I'm actually not just living a one-sided life. And a lot of them really say like, you know, these are the things you should do every day. I think they're making it a little bit too strict because I don't think that most of the people have the same interests as I do. Like I try to get out and go dancing. I do like swing dancing or salsa dancing once a week. And when I wake up in the morning, after that, it's hard to wake up after spending a night doing some type of social dance and be in a bad mood the next morning. I carry that into whatever I'm doing next. And, you know, if you told everyone, well, in order to achieve happiness or balance, you should learn how to swing dance. Not everyone is going to want to do that. I think you just got to kind of find a thing that you like, that you enjoy, you know, that puts a smile on your face and just do that. Totally. That's why I think pairing that with a little bit of self-discovery, like going through whether it's like your Myers-Briggs or like your Enneagram type or whatever, but knowing what your values are, knowing what recharges you, you know, like for introverts, totally makes sense that on a Friday, the right thing to do might be to read a book or go camping. And for me as an extrovert, like I know that I need to be around people in some form. And that's not draining for me. That's like incredibly energizing. That took me like a while to be okay with. Another thing I recommend is like having a therapist. But through having a therapist, I was like, is it wrong that I'm like going out late? And the therapist was like, do you feel bad? And I was like, no, I feel pretty good. And she was like, then it's probably not wrong. And I was like, okay. (laughs) <laughs> then I'm going to keep doing it. <laughs> oh man, that's awesome. You shared a bit about the things that you like to do to keep balance. Is there anything else you try to do on a daily or regular basis to really feel like you know, you're living your most fulfilled life or you're really setting yourself up to perform at the highest level? Yeah, you know, I do do the other things like having a to-do list and like being organized in a lot of ways, but I like to talk about the things that are like not as normal. I always used to have a really hard time getting up in the morning. And so, yeah, you know, I wake up in the morning and I read a book that I find to be just really fun, like not a self-help book, because it gives me something to look forward to. You know, I'm like in a cliffhanger from the morning before. So I like really want to get up and like read that book. And so like starting your day with something that you find super fun and super easy, like it's not stressful. You can do it when you're really tired. Going for a run for me, for example, is tiring. So like, I'm not going to do that first thing in the morning. And so now when I wake up, I make a coffee and I read a book for about 30 minutes, like as long as it takes me to finish the coffee at my own pace. Like I don't set a timer for that. I just like do it. I either read like fiction or something that's like not work related. I never used to read fiction. And in the last year, I've started devouring fantasy books and fiction books. That's one of those things that like everyone's always like, oh, did you read Black Swan or did you read Sapiens or like, you know, whatever the latest self help book is? And no, like I'm reading this like fantasy book and everyone's like, that's kind of weird. Like, did you read Sapiens yet? And I'm like, no, I'm not going to read Sapiens right now. Like starting your day without work, not sleeping next to your phone. I keep my phone in airplane mode until I get in the car to go to work. And so I'm just focused on starting my day with something that is purely enjoyable and fun for me. And then I kind of ease into the day that way. That's made it a lot easier for me to like get up, especially if it's like a tougher period and I need extra motivation. Everything you just said there about sleeping with your phone in airplane mode, I think how you start your day really sets you up you know, for how the rest of your day is going to go. If you started off in like frantic response mode, then you're pretty much 
you just screwed from the get go. Yeah, what you done? This is something I'm guilty of right now. I, I was like, oh man, I'm doing this so well, and you guys should do this too. And that was, you know, keep your phone on airplane mode, don't check it. Sometimes when I'm in different countries, I'll stay in hostels where there's a lot of other people sleeping in the room. So I throw my headphones in, throw some music on. Man, the first thing I do every morning is just instantly grab my phone, and I'm like, damn, I know I shouldn't do this, but, but it's so easy when it's right there. Yeah, I've been like storing a bunch of songs on Spotify in offline mode. If I'm watching Netflix before bed, like storing stuff in offline mode so that I can still have it in airplane mode. And then I'm like, I might still reach for my phone in the morning, but I'm like, okay, no email, no notifications. Man, once you start responding to everyone else, it kind of really takes you off your path for the day. So I feel like we've covered a lot of good stuff and the audience probably has a you know, a ton of new information on coffee, how it's brewed. We got some business advice and some day-to-day tips. First of all, is there anything you'd like to leave the audience with? And then if they want to pick up some sudden coffee, how would they do so? I actually do have something I want to leave the audience with. A lot goes into making a really good cup of coffee and to pay farmers and baristas a fair wage for the types of coffee people are getting, there's a lot that goes into it. And I tell this to people who are like, why are they price gouging me? Like, why is that latte at that cafe $5? And when you actually go to that cafe, like they're using some of the best coffee in the world. Like if it was wine, it would be a $200 bottle of wine. And so if you're getting that for like five bucks to pay the farmer and the barista and everyone else a fair wage, that's just how much it costs. And I try to educate people on that so much lately because we've really been spoiled and with climate change it's getting harder and harder to grow really great coffees and so like this is kind of the golden age of coffee so i encourage everyone to go to a really great cafe if you have one or try sudden tip your barista a little extra tip the cafe a little extra because that goes a long way. And yeah, for those who are interested in Sudden, check out our website, SuddenCoffee.com. Find us on Amazon. And then, yeah, we're going to be launching with more and more roasters in places like Whole Foods. If you ever see coffee in a test tube, that's made by us. Awesome. Well, I appreciate you taking the time to stop by and I'll make sure and, and drop some links to Sudden in the, in the show notes and uh, make sure that they want to find you. They know where to do it. Sounds great. Thanks a lot. Well, ladies and gents, that's a wrap for this week's episode. Big thanks to uh, Joshua for taking the time to stop by and talk about coffee and, you know, educating me a bit on the different types of coffee and how the whole instant coffee process works. Now, if you wouldn't mind doing me a favor, go ahead and head over to suddencoffee.com and order yourself some of Joshua's coffee. I'm definitely going to be drinking some. It sounded amazing especially the way he describes how the process is so much different and fresher than, than having some of that stuff that you might get out of your Keurig or you know those instant coffee cups. So order some of that stuff and support another startup guy. Now, if I can ask you one more tiny favor, yes, I'm gonna ask again for reviews. We could really use a few more reviews over on iTunes or Stitcher or whatever podcast app that you have. Give us whatever honest feedback that you have. Anything you have to say would be much appreciated. So that's a wrap for this week's show. I look forward to you tuning in next time.